In that case, I'll, I'll move on to uh, introduce uh, Colonel Gordon Fullerton, who got his bachelor's and master's degree from Caltech uh, in mechanical engineering, uh, did ROTC, and went on to the Air Force, where, uh, well, I guess he, ha he has flown uh, in the course of his career about a 135 different types of airplanes, 16,000 flying hours. Uh, he um, he flew F-86 interceptors, um, B-47 bombers, before going to Air Force Test Pilot School um, in the mid-60s. Uh, in 66, he was chosen by the Air Force for the Manned Orbiting Laboratory, which was going to be the Air Force's uh, space station. Uh, that program was canceled in 1969, and the MOL, uh, well, uh, some of the MOL astronauts came over to NASA and became NASA astronauts. Um, that was in the heyday of Apollo, and Gordon was support crew on the last four Apollo missions. Then went on to be the uh, test pilot on three of the first five uh, approach and landing tests. If you remember, that's when the uh, shuttle Enterprise, which was not designed for orbital flight, but was designed to test the basically the last 50,000 feet down to the ground, was dropped from the 747. Uh, went on to pilot the third shuttle flight, which was one of the orbital flight tests. That was the flight which landed in New Mexico, and uh, then commanded uh, STS-51F, which was the first uh, it was the first flight of the instrument pointing system. And that was also the flight uh, I'm trying to think. That was the flight where you lost the engine. Yeah, yeah the, we, which we talked about. That, that was the one, the one flight where where we had an engine shut down. We went over that in in some detail. So that oh, okay. so that was. Oh, well, that, that's fine. I mean, because I think they should hear about it from what it seemed like inside the cockpit. Now that they've they've heard kind of the technical details. In any case, uh, after leaving the astronaut office, uh, Gordon has moved into pilot's heaven, which is Edwards Air Force Base and the Dryden Test Flight Center, uh, where he basically spends all his time, well, not all of his time, because there's management stuff as well. Unfortunately, that's the price you pay. But basically, he gets to fly airplanes for a living, and uh, lots of different kinds, uh, including the carrier aircraft and the B-52, which launches uh, various test air aircraft and, uh, and a whole bunch of, uh, of other airplanes. Um, so if you remember, you know, in the whole systems engineering uh, approach to things, we talk about the conceived design, manufacture, test, and operation. So this is basically the final lecture, and this is the test and operation of the space shuttle from a pilot's point of view. So with that, I'll give it to you, Gordon. Okay, thanks. I, uh, I was sitting in, uh, in your uh, place back uh, 1958 when I was a grad student at Caltech for a year before heading off to the Air Force. Uh, well, almost 50 years ago, but uh, the uh, real blessing of my life is to be able to do what I uh, love to do for as long as I've done it, beyond all reason. And uh, anyway, I hope to share some of that with you this morning. This is my first time through this pitch. Uh, feel free to to holler out any questions uh, as we go, and uh, we'll stumble through it together. Uh, I plan to talk about uh, three different uh, phases of uh, the orbiter test program. The first were, were called ALT, the approach and landing tests. They consisted of really uh, 13 flights, five captive inert flights where the uh, Enterprise was uh, flown on top of the 747, but nobody in the cockpit. The controls were locked. Uh, that was to clear the envelope for the, the uh, 
kind of unlikely looking combination of a 7-4 with a orbiter on top. Then there were five captive act or three captive active flights uh, where we were uh, manned up in the orbiter where the systems running, the electronics, the uh, hydraulics were active, the controls were free to move a little bit, not full throw, and we uh, also determined how high the uh, combination could get because uh, altitude was, uh, and it wasn't 50,000 feet, it was more like uh, 28,000 feet max, even with the, the, sh the uh, 7 four engines over boosted uh, followed by five free flights where uh, we uh, actually pushed the button launched off the top and uh, and uh, glided to a landing the orbital flight test part of the shuttle program OFT consisted of four flights uh, STS is one through four of varying durations. The first STS-1 was uh, planned for just a couple days, get up and get down and um, have a look at how things looked after it flew. STS-2 was supposed to be five days. They had a fuel cell problem that cut their flight short, unfortunately for the crew. Uh, then uh, I was on STS-3. We were scheduled for seven days and because of a, of a raging dust storm at the planning, planned uh, landing site, uh, uh, we got an extra day, a real blessing, with uh, no uh, no tests to do. We had a, a free day in orbit, and uh, ended up with eight days. STS-4 planned and flew seven days, landing on the 4th of July with uh, President Reagan out there to watch. And uh, then there were then we get into operational flights, of which there've been a lot, something from over a hundred. The last flight to fly, the return to flight, uh, was STS-114, but the numbering system got uh, went through a couple phases, so uh, there haven't been 114 flights. I don't know how many it has been, but there have been a bunch. So I'll talk about uh, three of the, uh, well, more than three flights, but the, the ALT flights. Uh, the crew patch, uh, you always got to have a crew patch. That's a major hurdle that you uh, uh, have to overcome when you're assigned to a crew is to get the patch designed and then get it approved by upper management. Uh, my uh, part of the uh, OFT, uh, STS-3 in 1982, and finally uh, then an operational flight, 51F in 1985. My job uh, prior to any of these flights uh, I worked into was a dream job for uh, really system engineering, I guess, and uh, for a, a pilot. I'd been to test pilot school. I was intrigued uh, with all the airplanes I flew with a cockpit design and uh, was very aware of the uh, flaws of cockpit design. Uh, seems like uh, sometimes engineers lay awake nights trying to make it hard to operate subsystems. So I uh, got in uh, at the beginning of, uh, of the orbiter uh, crew interface and became, uh, before it was over, sort of the czar uh, was responsible to sign off all the drawings, lots of uh, reviews. It was a great uh, responsibility because I was uh, uh, immediately and early into subsystem design because you have to know what the subsystem does to make any intelligent choice of, of what the controls and display should be. This is a view of uh, an orbit not the Enterprise, but uh, probably the, uh, I don't know whether it's a simulator or the real airplane, they look alike, but uh, one of the orbital capable shuttles. Uh, lots, this is like the, the little old ladies always say when, when you're out on static display for Armed Forces Day and oh look at all the, the uh, things, how do you remember what they all do? Well that's, that really is a challenge uh, to make make things straightforward and uh, uh, I became uh, painfully aware especially later on when we had a lot of experiments coming in that engineers 
in their little ivory tower building a system in the lab are so totally personally familiar with how their stuff works that it doesn't bother them that the switches are unlabeled or labeled illogically and they bring that all in and want to put it in the orbiter and uh, and when the crew says wait a minute uh, I have to remember that before I turn on switch A, switch C and D have got to be turned on in uh, this order or the whole thing will blow up. And they say, oh yeah, that's the way it is. And they know it so well personally. And yet when you're overwhelmed with a whole lot of experiments, I'm sure you ran into it on your flight, uh, that, that all the stuff that is just uh, uh, totally... Uh, familiar to the guy that invented it becomes a challenge when you're faced with a whole lot of them, a limited amount of time to learn it. And uh, so standardization of what uh, the, <coughs> the scheme, especially in the software, most of the, well there are a lot of gadgets. In fact, if you count all the switches, uh, gauges, circuit breakers, Upstairs, downstairs, and the mid deck, there's about 2,100 total in the orbiter cockpit. Uh, but the real challenge is what shows up on the screens here. Uh, and so the software was a bigger thing in making them all play together. <coughs> Here's a higher view, and the overhead panel above your head in the forward cockpit has a lot of other switches. Uh, an example of what I'm talking about, uh, this array of switches right here controls the uh, reaction control system valving the, uh, and then the orbital maneuvering system. Uh, back in Apollo, which I worked on when I first came to uh, Johnson Space Center, I learned uh, while lying uh, many hours in the uh, Apollo uh, crew simulator that that had the worst cockpit ever designed by man. Uh, as an example, uh, it had a, a pressurization system, uh, a helium pressurization system to push the propellants for the reaction control jets out of the tanks and then the uh, valves that went to the various array of thrusters all around the command module. And uh, one would think logically, okay, if you have something to turn on the helium, you label it helium on off. And uh, then the manifold, the next branch in the Christmas tree manifold uh, would be uh, system A versus system B or something like that. And in fact, it had names like that, but they put the switches in a long row and they labeled them A through H, right there on the panel. Uh, no clue as to what you were throwing, so every move you made in the cockpit, and some of these things were critical, required you to either be you know, a metal giant or open a checklist and say, okay, to pressurize system B, I've got to throw B on and then A next and then H last or something like that. So. Uh, obviously unacceptable and became my uh, career and uh, mania to try to improve that. The first orbiter simulator uh, built was called the OAS, Orbiter Aeroflight Simulator. It was a, on a moving base platform like the, the standard airline uh, uh, simulators you see today. Uh, this is uh, Fred Hayes and I sitting in the cockpit. This one was built originally to be uh, the Enterprise, and the Enterprise uh, was uh, OV-101 in the scheme of things, uh, a numbering of orbiters as they were built. Uh, 101 had only the systems it needed to fly the approach and landing tests. The plan was to retrofit it later to make it into an orbit capable, but f for the uh, ALT program it had just what you needed and only that to uh, fly in the atmosphere. Very short flights. But this is our first chance to look at uh, what we had uh, and what we're getting into as far as uh, pilot uh, concerns. 
I guess you've had all the subsystems, right? You're all uh, completely uh, briefed and experts on uh, subsystems by the people that have preceded me here in the course. I'll give you, though, a quick, uh, quick review here. Uh, the avionics system, the, the shuttle is built with a, inside the outer mole line as a, the pressure vessel that is roughly uh, back to the uh, forward bulkhead of the payload bay and uh, is embedded inside the uh, basically aluminum structure with a thermal protection system applied to the outside. And most of the avionics are in racks right up here, right in there with you in the cockpit on the, on the mid deck. The stowage uh, lockers are aft of the uh, racks full of black boxes and lots of wires. And the other place there were avionics is back here just aft of the aft bulkhead of the payload bay and there's some areas where they put uh, items like rate gyros and accelerometers uh, a, a long way back. It, uh, from a systems engineering standpoint, uh, we Fred Hayes and I were out at uh, Palmdale where they built all the orbiters. Uh, well, late one night seems like the, the testing always happens uh, after 2 a.m. Uh, the tests would run round the clock and uh, we were out there way after midnight in the cockpit participating in the first time they're going to close the loop between the rate gyros and the flight control system, which is contained back up here in the nose, in the uh, general purpose computers. Uh, the whole orbiter was suspended on some, some big uh, airfield bags, so it had compliance to move. And uh, the hydraulic system was on, uh, powered by a, a facility hydraulic source. So the elevons were powered, and the rudder speed brake was powered, and uh, and the process let us down for the very first time that uh, we're going to close the loop between the software up here and the rate gyros, particularly accel accelerometers mounted back in the back. And it, it was a milestone and we had uh, people stationed around the back to see if anything uh, sp spit out hydraulic fluid or whatever. Uh, anyway, we... Uh, we went up to the glare shield, pushed the button to go into CSS, control stick steering, which hooked the stick up now uh, to the flight control system. Um, I'll never forget. We pushed the button and a, uh, a rumble started. And the rumble built very rapidly to a violent rumble. I mean, we were being bounced around the cockpit. This is 150,000 pounds of airplane is dancing on these rubber bags. And uh, uh, it didn't take us long to say this doesn't feel good. We pulled the button that downloads back to direct control so there's no feedback. And the upshot of it was that these rate arrows are mounted on this flexible bulkhead and uh, that hadn't been uh, taken into account properly. And so there was a, a structural resonance that uh, was just diversion. Pretty, in spite of all the ground tests down at Downey and the Iron Bird mock-ups and everything, when we put it in the real airplane, it, it tried to jump off the, the uh, supports. And uh, uh, Fred and I were in the cockpit and our eyes were big and we called a control room, which were people back in the adjacent room. Seems like most spacecraft tests traditionally are done. The engineers are all locked in a windowless room. No view of the real hardware down at the Cape. They're miles away. Uh, when the spacecraft's either out on the pad or in the, uh, the main checkout building. And so uh, they, they said, no, procedure says this is okay. We want you to re-engage. <laughs> so we tried one more time. And this time the guys stationed in back that were watching said, this doesn't look good. They started hollering on the loop. So we pitched it off. And we went into a raging argument whether 
we need to complete this test, the engineers were saying, and we were saying, we don't want to break something. And they got people out of bed down in Downey, California, the controls engineers. And so it was uh, a, uh, a memorable night. Uh, they, uh, the resolution was finally uh, a redesign of uh, the mounting area back there and, and a reanalysis of the uh, vibrational modes of the F bulkhead to sort it all out. Uh, Here's what we had back in uh, for crew interface. You saw in the earlier picture, up front three CRTs, monochrome green. That's a, that was uh, either green or nothing on the screen. And we had a keyboard, two keyboards, three CRTs. So there's always this little uh, concern when you're punching on a keyboard, you want to be sure it's selected to the CRT you think you're doing something on another marginal design but that's that's what we ended up with you notice we don't ha we got a hexadecimal keyboard here uh, we got some strange keys called item uh, and electric and ops which had to do with this uh, truly unique way you cause things to happen through software and lots of things were critical through software and then this uh, rather dim green screen. This was way before the days, uh, I guess Bill Gates was still here at MIT or maybe even hadn't uh, registered yet, I don't know. It was way before Windows uh, 1.0. And so uh, uh, it seems almost uh, comical now when you compare it to even modern uh, airliner crew interface with uh, glass cockpits, but uh, uh, we were breaking new ground here. And it, it, it even at the time seemed antiquated because that's all they were willing to uh, embrace in the way of, uh, of computer control and design. And it was unique and it caused lots of uh, uh, headaches and delays. Uh, the, the big thing about the Orbiter with its... Uh, I'll go back. Uh, data processing system the decision was made that everything is going to be done in these uh, all-powerful general-purpose computers of which there were five in an array that worked together flight control system management navigation uh, inertial uh, subsystem control of everything and so the result was the software loads as they were built had lots of flaws when they came down yet we couldn't fix them you know we had cases as as dumb as uh, a display that showed uh, the free on loop a pump on and it when it got through all the software build it was backwards it would say off when it was really on it seemed like a simple fix right go back to the programmer and rewrite the code but we couldn't do it. We had to live with it for a long period of time through training until another whole load was built because the load that would fix this dumb little bi-level mistake uh, was also the one that steered you during ascent. And I didn't want to, so everything was frozen and there was great fear of changing anything that would ricochet through something truly critical. And so, even when we got to uh, STS-3, we flew with a book about this thick of program notes uh, that, that told you line after line what was wrong, you know, what was backwards, what was, uh, what was a, a trap, and uh, really a, a big challenge for the crew to embrace and live with because there just wasn't time in the program to build another load check it out through all the different uh, labs that had to uh, certify it. Uh, that's a vote for modular software where you can you can change something here and be assured you're not bollocksing up something else in the same uh, machine. 
Ohm's RCS. This is the, the two pods on uh, either side of the vertical tail are uh, a couple big ohms propellant tanks, uh, oxidizer and fuel, hypergolic. So we didn't need any ignition system as soon as these came together in a thruster. Uh, you had thrust. And uh, there were, I think, 44 main thrusters. Here's four yaw jets uh, firing out to the side. This would be pitch jets, uh, uh, the same thing repeated on the other side. And up in the nose of the forward RCS, uh, so they had jets that fired up and out to the side and down. And uh, uh, I mentioned the controls in the cockpit, which we did. One of my uh, great successes was getting the orbiter uh, panels to be arranged in a, in a plumbing uh, layout so that uh, you could see what you're pressurizing when you turned on the helium for a given leg and that sort of thing. Helium tanks are what pressurized in a, a really clever system of uh, of OH control, that is, when you're in zero G and you got propellant floating around randomly and you turn on the helium to push it toward the outlet, if the outlet's uh, uncovered, the helium's going to squirt right up. But they had an elaborate system of surface tension kind of baffles that kept and trapped fuel near the uh, near the outlet of the tank so that when the thrust came on and all the propellant went down where it should, it sort of recharged this uh, chamber at the bottom of the tanks to, uh, to keep it uh, flowing smoothly and not, uh, not lose all the pressurization. Uh, I remember the first my impression of, of what uh, reaction control jets would be like is uh, based on science fiction movies where you see the spacecraft out there and there's little pss, pss, squirts of uh, jets, you know, that nudge, nudge you around. And we went out to uh, the uh, ground test facility at White Sands on a field trip out there where they had a they actually had the forward RCS set up and they were going to do real firings of, of the main jets out there. And uh, we were probably a couple hundred feet away from the test set up and we're out there waiting uh, for the, the sequence of jet firings to start on a test. And the first one, the first firing of one of the main jets, which are right up around 900 pounds thrust, was just a short pulse. And everybody went about three feet off the ground. I mean, it was like, like you fired a howitzer. It was just stunning. Wham! Wham! And it just blew you away. And, and the realization, we're going to be in the cockpit here, and these things are firing right outside the windshield. Uh, uh, they did. In space, uh, the ignition transient uh, ricochets through the structure. You can hear this kind of booming effect. But once they're on, if it's a long duration firing, uh, it's silent. It's in the same way visually, you can see a flash when, when the, uh, the fuel is led a little bit in front of the oxidizer to make sure you don't overheat something. And so there's incomplete combustion at the ignition. As you can see, a flash go out there. But once on, during an ohms burn, for instance, when these ohm tensions are firing and you're looking back at the aft, you see the flash and they're on and they're pushing and you can feel it, but uh, otherwise invisible. That's the way you remember. Yeah. On the other hand, there are vernier jets, little guys. I don't know if they're shown here, but there's little 25-pound thrusters or something that's used 98% of the time on orbit. You really are doing the pss, pss kind of thing with the vernier jets, and you can't hear those or see anything when they're going off. In fact, we uh, got everybody quiet and kind of held on to the walls just trying to see if we could barely detect when a vernier jet fired uh, physically in the cockpit. Interesting. Um, the orbiter is one giant uh, heat transfer machine. Uh, lots of uh, 
lots of calories of uh, heat energy pumped around from one end to the other. Uh, and so there's, uh, there's uh, water loops within the cabin that transfer the heat to uh, freon loops that are, uh, the fluid is pumped through the radiators to reject heat. Uh, there are, in spite of all these heat rejection systems, then there are heaters everywhere. Whole banks of heaters to keep stuff from freezing. And uh, then for the landing and takeoff phases, there are flash evaporators that, that uh, flash water and or uh, ammonia when you get down where water, when you're down in the atmosphere, the, uh, you use ammonia to uh, cool the loops. Well, of course, the, the payload bay doors are closed, so uh, and it turns out STS-3 was a, a major test of it, was to test all these loops and how the structure responded to long durations and given attitudes with the sun shining on one side and cold space on the other side and how the structure would uh, distort, or hopefully not distort, and how all that system would work. As it turned out, uh, you like lots of redundancy. This is probably the, the weak point I thought in the whole orbiter design. Uh, we got three engines. We proved that you can get there when only two. Uh, but the Freon loops, there were two redundant through the radiators. And if one Freon loop pump quit, you're in a severe emergency. That means stop everything, power down severely, turn off all the, the computers except one, uh, uh, get in a proper attitude and be ready and go into a uh, panic reconfiguration to come back and land. Uh, originally the design had three Freon loops. It could lose one and go on with, uh, with uh, no no concern, but as it turned out, uh, the heat loads were so high and the weight uh, criticality uh, determined that uh, all we had uh, electrical power to run were two loops, and uh, so we ended up with uh, a single free end loop, which fortunately, as far as I know, never failed. But if it had, uh, it would have been a crash, uh, deorbit, and uh, uh, landing under severely powered down conditions. So the well, it's kind of mundane, and people don't worry, they don't think about it as a primary system. The uh, thermal control really was critical. Payload bay doors. This is a busy chart, but it indicates these are really comp complicated. Uh, uh, 60 feet long, and something like uh, 120 little motor-driven latches to uh, latch them closed. Uh, and you don't just go chunk closed like the Bombay on a B-52 and it's closed. To, to close the payload bay doors, you you uh, get them close and then the latches along the bulkhead all in a zipper fashion have to sequentially close and then you go down the, the center section to, to uh, latch the two uh, left and right doors together, all software controlled to, uh, and there was a lot of concern that we addressed on SDS-3 particularly about whether this is all going to work. If you've been uh, floating around with these uh, pointed to dark space, would they distort to where the zipper scheme would work? We worried about it enough that uh, part of our uh, emergency training, uh, contingency training, we spent a lot of time underwater in the uh, neutral buoyancy tank uh, looking at a system uh, going out EVA with a, uh, a series of come-alongs, you know, the kind of things you use to pull a motor out of a car, uh, uh, that, that kind of thing, uh, that we could uh, go down there and hook up and lash the, the doors shut to actually uh, kind of 
uh, manually get them shut and then latch them shut with these. Uh, so uh, fortunately, that's never had to use. And this complex system has worked good. But it was scary the, the uh, first time uh, we flew it on STS-3. That was a big concern. Okay, uh, what I got here, hydraulic system. Hydraulics are uh, hydrazine-powered uh, turbines that run at some ridiculous RPM, like 200,000 RPM uh, to drive hydraulic pumps uh, back here in the back end. And then they're crucial during uh, launch uh, because they got to hold the elevons in position, but they also got to provide the uh, muscle to gimbal the uh, main engines and keep you steering straight during launch. Uh, during entry, they're what you use to fly when you get back into a dynamic pressure situation, control the rudder speed brake, and uh, the body flap. Body flap is a big surface all that sticks out underneath the uh, main engine bells and is a slow moving uh, trim device. The body flap is always moved. Uh, you go through this Mach 25 to Mach 0 envelope and the, the, uh, the trim conditions necessary with these big elevons uh, varies a lot. So to desaturate the elevons and keep them in, uh, in basically fared with the wing, the body flap's your trim device. <laughs> And it's, you know, it's like this row of tables long and this wide. <coughs> I remember asking to see the motor that it's driven uh, a lot of mechanical advantage uh, by a hydraulic motor. A, a guy took me around. I couldn't find the actuator, you know, for the body flap. He showed me the motor is this big around and this long, <laughs> little hydraulic motor. So you can do anything with mechanical advantage. Uh, but didn't have to move very fast. Uh, finally, on the system pictures here, the uh, RMS, uh, hopefully you've heard about this, is built by uh, SPAR up in Canada. It's Canadian's main uh, contribution to the orbiter program. Pretty uh, magical device mounted along. It can go on either side, but for our flights, uh, mounted on the uh, left-hand side or the right if you're looking out the back windows at it and uh, had joints logically called the shoulder joint uh, elbow wrist joint uh, all uh, electrically electric motor driven uh, but the interesting thing was a control you had hand controllers um, mounted in the aft part of the on the right console in the back where you looked out and you could uh, work in a mode where you were actually driving the end uh, left, right, up, down, in, out without regard to whatever joint was done. That's all resolved by the software and uh, work well. The end effector was a, a clever uh, kind of a hollow uh, cylindrical device that, that would rotate inside and uh, three cables that would be out, out uh, curved around the periphery of the inside this cavity when, when activated. Uh, you put this over a post on whatever you wanted to grab onto with a knob on the end. You go over the post and then rotate the inner, inner barrel and the cables would wrap up and grab onto the post and then they would retract in to rigidize and that was the grabber on the RMS. And we flew this uh, on STS-3. I'll show you later. Okay, well anyway, that's a subsystem review. Uh, let me uh, show you how things went during approach and landing tests. Now, let's see, I've got to get back to, I've never figured out how to embed video in PowerPoint, so I'm going to be doing it manually. Any questions while we're waiting on this? Come up. Well, this is uh, the desert around uh, where I live and a <laughs> Gila monster and a Joshua tree to set the scene. And uh, here you have uh, 
OV101. The numbering system, as it turned out, is kind of uh, interesting. They built OV99 as the structural test article. Uh, was strictly built to be in the lab and uh, uh, do all the structural testing on it. 101 then was the first orbiter uh, built, the Enterprise, being hauled from Palmdale across the back roads and the desert roads to get over to Edwards in these scenes. And uh, 101 was the ALT airplane. You can see kind of phony looking uh, RCS. Uh, it, it, it had, as I mentioned, only the systems that you needed to uh, fly atmospheric flight. Uh, so this was a big thing, uh, getting it across country. Uh, it had a pitot boom on it. It had just simulated uh, thermal protection, styrofoam painted to look kind of like they thought the, the space vehicles would look, but wasn't real. It was uh, put in the uh, mating and docking device, which is at uh, NASA Dryden, where I work now, hoisted up, and then the uh, 747-905, the first shuttle carrier aircraft, uh, was pulled under and they mated them up. I remember flying out to Edwards and seeing this unlikely combination and uh, I thought the first time I saw the two together I thought they can't be serious but then I realized I was going to be in it so uh, there were uh, 13 total flights. This is a taxi test. Uh, when, when you got an aerodynamic test, you can sneak up and so you do baby steps. This was just a uh, high-speed run down the runway to see if it would rotate and anything would uh, shake uh, alarmingly. And that looked good. So uh, the preparations proceeded for the first of the captive inert flights. Uh, this is uh, Fitz Fulton uh, and Tom McMurtry, both real good friends, and they were the crew on the 747 for this for first milestone flight. A lot of people were out watching and wondering if it would fly, which it did very well, and uh, off it went. You know, it's a, a longer uh, front attached structure there, and the orbiter is purposely on there at an angle of attack to. Uh, to uh, produce lift. I fly the uh, 7-4 for ferry flights now uh, to, to haul orbiters back to the Cape when they landed Edwards as the last one did. And uh, the nose, the, the front uh, bipod is much shorter so that the orbiter's down for less drag for the combination. But uh, this, kind of, this setup here was so that we could get the orbiter off the top and not hit the tail. Uh, there's a rumble. Uh, the crew noticed a shaking. It's still the case when you fly. These uh, vertical fins were added onto the horizontal stabs to increase directional stability because the orbiter blanks a lot of flow over the normal vertical. And in fact, they overdid it a little bit. There's too much directional stability which has resulted in a weird situation is your crosswind limit when you have an orbiter on board is greater than when it's not. <laughs> because you've got so much directional stability and a crosswind there's a, a strong weather veining and you run out a normal rudder without an orbiter. But, uh, so you're good only to 15 knots crosswind with the orbiter on. Uh, the limit is 20 knots. And it's a good limit. I've flown them both ways in crosswinds, and indeed at those numbers you run out of rudder as you land and are rolling out. The strong weather veining tendency is, is leading you out the side of the runway. Anyway, that looked good. And so they came back, and, and we had a, a big post-flight party. ALT was great for parties. We had 13 post-flight parties. <laughs> So uh, after five flights, well, and at the same time uh, we're doing the ALT flights, we're developing the shuttle training aircraft. This is a Gulfstream II with big uh, uh, side force generators on the belly, and it's an airborne simulator. Uh, the left seat is set up with the orbiter instruments, and uh, the right seat was the standard Gulfstream cockpit. 
I flew, I flung thousands of dives at the ground in the STA, uh, preparing for the, the whole idea of uh, first time for sure, uh, unpowered uh, landing that you have to do right the first time. And back in the simulator here for lots more uh, runs. And it was, it was a great time because everything was brand new, uh, very interesting. Uh, this, this is a camera and an actual model. This is before the days of computer generated uh, video. Uh, so it uh, flew the little camera down to landing. And we learned a lot about uh, handling characteristics. One that we really wondered about when, when you were, when you made a uh, lateral input to roll the orbiter in the simulator, it, it would bang you. It would, it was a, this lateral lurch, we called it. Uh, it would jolt you sideways. And we thought, this can't be real. It doesn't make any sense. No airplane we ever flew does that. Uh, we squawked it. They came back and said, well, the equations all worked out. So uh, we lived with it and thought it was just a artifact. It was uh, snuck in there and didn't worry about it. Uh, now the captive active started where we actually got in and uh, cranked things up. Uh, on the second flight I was uh, chasing in the T-38 and Engel and Truly were in the cockpit and I noticed uh, shiny looking uh, on the side. The big X on the CRT is what happens when the computer that's driving that CRT quits. That's sort of the, uh, the, the panic symbol when the X shows up. Uh, anyway, I noticed uh, a leak, as it turned out to be. We had a severe hydrazine leak. Hydrazine is bad stuff to have leaking. And uh, one of the uh, APU uh, supply tanks let go, plus they had an over temp. Uh, so we uh, we found things that were wrong and would have been uh, it made these captive flights worthwhile if, it, uh, if we'd just gone and launched off on the first one it could have been more exciting than it needed to be so we had five of those and uh, Fred Hayes and I got uh, the odd numbered flights one three and five five more post flight parties and then we decided we're ready to go so it was on, uh, well, this is uh, the last of the captive active flights. The, the scheme by which we planned to get off of here and not take off the tail of the 747 was that the 74 would go as high as it could go. It could get up to around 27,000 feet uh, with uh, engines uh, overboosted. Pratt and Whitney said you can go this long with uh, extra power. And then uh, nose over and speed up to 240 knots. It was climbing maybe 190, 200 knots uh, with, a, with a little downhill push. We got up to 240. At 240, the, the SEA pilots would go to idle power and air brakes up to put drag on the carrier. At that condition of 240 knots and at the angle of attack of the uh, Orbiter, it was actually lifting its own, more than its own weight. So the, the result is uh, we really dropped the carrier, as, as it turns out. There are three quarters of a G difference between the two. And so when uh, Fred, we get a lot of views for some reason of Fred's left shoulder, he's in the left seat, and he mashed the uh, separation button after the after Fitz and the carrier aircraft hollered uh, carrier ready, that is they were back at idle with the speed brakes up, uh, push the go button and bang off uh, all seven uh, explosive bolts would blow. Control room was in Houston, strange enough. We're talking to people back in the, uh, in the, the old uh, JSC control room when we're out at Edwards flying these flights, but it was just like they were there. Okay, we're, we're coming up on a condition, and this was in August of 77. All the ALT flights happened in 1977. Uh, you notice there's a tail cone on here. The tail cone was flown on the first three flights. Uh, 
that makes a big difference. It smooths the flow so that the buffet on the tail of the, the uh, carrier aircraft was less, and it just about doubled the L over D of the orbiter. Uh, okay, we're going to arm. And uh, we'll get there. <laughs> get a go from the control. And we had two chases, one off to the right and one in, uh, in trail separation. And just like uh, the engineer said and the load cells that we had had on there testing exactly which way the thing was tugging before we did it, said we would do, straight up. This is slow motion. Nothing's leaking. This is uh, vortexes off the wingtips causing condensation. And away we went. And the next, I mean, simultaneously with this bang that shudders through the airplane when all these explosive bolts, a big X on the CRT in front of me. So uh, we had cue cards and I had, uh, we'd practiced this. And my job while Fred flew, he, uh, he actually got a uh, vertical clear from this chase pilot and then I'll then rolled into a bank and a lateral clear from the guy that was chasing from behind and knew that it was okay to push over because we we're only now at 200 knots and we wanted to get to 300 and it took a, a considerable push over to get up to speed. Meanwhile, I'm pulling circuit breakers on rate gyros and turning off accelerometers at our pre-planned uh, uh, procedure to uh, accommodate flaws in the redundancy management. When you lose one computer, you also take out part of the sensors in the flight control system and to be sure that a subsequent failure wouldn't put you in worse shape. It took about a minute's worth of manual reconfiguration on my part and I kind of missed the whole first part of the flight. When I turned around, I realized, hey, this thing is flying good. It's smooth and uh, it's on speed and Fred was uh, flying. We flew a rectangular pattern out of a downwind leg here as we nosed over and I got my chance to roll into a left 90 degree turn and, and fly base leg and as I put the stick over to roll I got this big lateral lurch just like the simulator set. Uh, I was, it just stunned me. The center gun they were right after all. Uh, it's just the nature of something flying at high alpha and rotating about a, a uh, stability axis and the cockpit it gets slid sideways. It's got big uh, elevons, so it flies like a fighter, it really does, and you're doing it all with a little stick that doesn't move much. Anyway, we uh, came down final at uh, 290, I think it was, uh, flared out. My job was to put the gear down, a critical function. And uh, we're landing on Lake Bed 1-7. And the, on the dry lake at Edwards, which is something like 10 miles long, so we're pretty good margins there. And uh, Fred took the airplane back from me. I only got the fly base leg, but uh, he, we touched down at about 185, I think it was. Nice and smooth. It was beautiful. The speed brakes come out to help uh, cushion the uh, derotation. Nose gear down. And uh, we raised a little dust as we rolled to a stop, so it was uh, a good day. Now we had a really good post-flight party after this one. <laughs> and see the uh, rudder speed brake flared there, and the elevons full up, and so now Joe Engel and Dick Truly did it again. Uh, a couple of weeks later, or thereabouts, they they, uh, they got their turn and they uh, did much the same flight, repeated it. And uh, oh, one thing you see the pitot boom out there. Pitot boom is strictly on the Enterprise, put out there to get good air data out in front of this this big blivet of an airplane, which is hard to get uh, good measurements. There you can see, okay, uh, let me get the next one going here, if I can figure out how to get out of this. 
says the excitement came later. On SDS-1, uh, I looked out there when we are on final, I had time to look out and look at the pitot beam, and man, it's going through an arc of about three feet. At the, it, it was built with the perfect resonance of everything else with the airplane, and it was just a blur out there going back and forth. <laughs> and I, I really thought it was going to break off. but. Uh, was that your only pitot source, or did you have the normal ones in the... Uh, good question. I, somehow we had at least inertially derived ones. Everything looked good. And uh, actually, it still put out good airspeed, even though it was a blur. And I think the, the beta averaged out. And, and so, uh, anyway, it wasn't a problem we noticed. Uh, uh, other than visually, it looked like it was going to break off. So they, they changed and stiffened it up so it wasn't a problem on subsequent flights. Now you can see here we're at, we're at free flight four now, which was the other crew's uh, turn. But the tail cone's off. And uh, <coughs> our final approach glide slope with tail cone on was 11 degrees. With tail cone off, it was 23 degrees. <laughs> halves your L over D. So you're uh, really in a, a, a steep dive. Normal uh, ILS into Logan out here would be two and a half degrees. So uh, you're coming down uh, gangbusters. And it's, it's even uh, worse in ALT than it was on uh, the orbital uh, missions, which were coming down with the same configuration, but much heavier. Heavier, you got more gravity working for you, and you can fly shallower. Doesn't seem to figure, but that's the way it is. So uh, uh, 19 degrees is a normal uh, return from orbit, uh, final approach glide slope. We were up in the 20s. Uh, kind of catching up a little. One of our jobs with uh, uh, on the flight preceding this was to try the braking. We just let her roll out on the first couple flights. <coughs> they wanted to do brake tests and Fred jumped on the brakes after we touched down and another resonance problem. Interaction between the structure and the uh, anti-skid, which is, and I thought it was going to break the airplane. I, it, it was just violent, uh, shuddering, shaking, everything rattling in the cockpit. And I hollered at Fred, get off the brakes, we're going to break something. And he said, nope, the card says we got to do max braking. I was pleading with him to get off the brakes, which he did. Easy fix. When they flew the next flight here, they did hard braking and it was smooth. Uh, they went into the change of resistor and the feedback uh, electronics uh, and that did it. I mean, it was instant fix. Uh, so uh, it says there still is reason to do flight tests because su surprises uh, happen. Uh, Okay, so now uh, free flight five. It turns out that um, there was a little break here. We're back at Houston, and uh, Prince Charles, uh, he wasn't married yet at that time, but he came by on a visit, and we gave him a ride in uh, the uh, simulator. He'd had some flying time, and he got into horrendous PIO. I mean, he was out of control and <laughs> crashed in the simulator. And felt bad, and we said, nah, it's because you're not used to the stick and everything. And that was his tour. So now, for this flight, he was actually out along the runway. They had him out there so he could watch. And uh, the objective here was to land on the concrete runway, put it right on the line. There's a white line 5,000 feet down. <coughs> and Fred was really working at it putting in a lot of inputs. Look at the elevons go on there. You see them? Uh, and he's making roll commands. So skip. <laughs> and uh, so we logged a couple landings. <laughs> and down and uh, rolled to a stop. And uh, when afterwards we called out and he came up to say hello and said, Oh, you made me feel good. You guys did as bad as I did. 
There he is right there with his binoculars. Well, it scared everybody to death. I, it, it looked worse from outside than it did in the cockpit. And uh, the, f the flight control flaw that we found, though, was serious. Uh, you got elevons that do both pitch and roll. So in the software, when you're asking for both pitch and roll at the same time, it's got to decide which one do I move. I'll uh, stop this. It's just a supposition of what would come. Uh, so the software has to has to give priority, and they decided to give priority to pitch. And uh, roll was sort of taken second priority when you were, you had to limit the commands of the elevons to within the the uh, capability of the hydraulic system. So the result was a lag in roll response when you're working pitch hard. And the lag was up around two tenths to three tenths of a second. You, you may be aware of study flight control system. Any any kind of system that has a three t quarter second delay between uh, input and response is asking for a PIO, pilot induced oscillation. And we had a big time in roll. Fred was clanking back and forth, stop to stop and roll, trying to level the wings after that first skip. I heard uh, the controller banging over there, and I suggested uh, if, if you get off, maybe it'll damp, because we're, we're doing this. And sure enough, that's, that's what he did. He, he stopped the inputs, the airplane damped right away, and then it went OK. But. Uh, there's something that we we had a fix, obviously. Uh, here's a picture just a uh, microsecond after uh, liftoff on uh, one of the last two. Well, the decision, there was a lot of debate about do we go back and f fix the flight control and fly some more ALT. But this is a huge production. It was costing time and we weren't getting into orbit. And the decision was made now we'll do it in simulators and in flight simulators and uh, fix the problem but press on. So that was the end of ALT. At the end of which, when you do flight tests, you talk about opening the envelope of an airplane. Well, the envelope of the space shuttle is 400 nautical miles south altitude and Mach 25 and in ALT we got to 4 miles and 0.3 Mach so it's really down in the lower left corner but worth doing. Uh, test results uh, I've mentioned as we went, we had that APU fuel leak, fixed it, didn't come back. Uh, the Buffett uh, lift and drag was right on what we expected, no surprises there. And the qualities were good, even with the lurch, it was not a, not a problem. Uh, mentioned the pitot boom, the anti-skid, the SCA did the job, although it struggled to, to get us up to, with the tail cone off, it could only get to about 18,000 feet. So this was not a good program to build up your flying time. <laughs> I get two, uh, it was about a total of, uh, in three flights, about 12 minutes of flying time. <laughs> and uh, the biggie I mentioned, the, uh, the handling qualities and the PIO tendency that we fixed with lots of studies later and changes in the way the uh, control uh, equations were written. And as a final thing, they did some more flights with the, the nose lowered down and determined what the ferry flight performance of the combination is. I have later after flying in space, checked out in the 747 and still fly it on the ferry flights. And it uh, does the job. It burns lots of gas. I figured out that uh, the combination cross country, uh, uh, the mileage is uh, about 300 feet per gallon. So football field per gallon of fuel, uh, 40,000 pounds an hour, so there's a fuel flow. Uh, it, it goes about one and a half times its own length on a gallon of gas, but gets there. I don't have to buy the fuel. A lot of people said, wasn't this scary, uh, ALT? Actually, uh, from a risk standpoint, we had ejection seats. So if anything had gone wrong, 
anywhere along the line, we could have pulled the handle and, and jumped out. The scariest part of it was, uh, when we got in, and during the uh, captive flights, <coughs> we just walk up the stairway and crawl through the hatch, in the same way getting out. But after the, the uh, captive active flights, we'd land still on, on the orbiter. And they had this cherry picker to get us out. Now the, the situation here, it's a round hatch hinged at the bottom. Uh, they, only, they only wanted one person at a time on the, the end of this uh, thing. So you open the round hatch and then they bring this up, the guy on the ground, and he doesn't want to get too close and ding. So he leaves about this much of a gap from this round hatch, which is 60 feet above the ground, that you've got to crawl out on your knees and then stand up and then make the leap across the uh, thing onto this wobbly uh, cage up there. But uh, that's how our uh, captive actives went. Were you wearing flight suits for all these tests? I mean, have you had ejection suits? Yeah, we're wearing regular flight suit, helmet, like you would in a F-18 or any any fighter. Yeah, not pressure suits. We didn't have a severe cabin pressure risk at 25,000 feet. I, I put here uh, some. Uh, let me get into the full screen mode here some thoughts about what's different when you test an aircraft versus a spacecraft. Well, air, airplane, you can do little baby steps, incremental tests. You can do static runs of the propulsion up to the full power in the airplane itself. Then you taxi it slow and then faster and faster down the runway. You can rotate the nose a little bit. Uh, the first flight, you'll fly slow and leave the gear down and then land soon and check everything and you can hold off till perfect day to do it. Uh, and then you go faster and faster to expand the envelope. If anything goes wrong, you can peel off and get back on the ground quick. And uh, as I mentioned, you can always pull the handle and bail out if things go really bad. You got a spacecraft, it's all or nothing. Uh, you got to use uh, the propulsion at, at its uh, full power. Uh, all the critical systems, the subsystems, have got to work. Uh, you can't make a quick abort. Long delays, like days, are sometimes required to get back to the conditions where you can make an appropriate landing. And uh, the weather can turn sour and the uh, at the time. So when you're going to uh, flight test a spacecraft, you've got to have a lot of redundancy in the design to allow for the bad day that has to carry you through a considerable amount of time. You necessarily got to test everything to the limit. Uh, wind tunnel, CFD, thermal vacuum, because the environment is uh, lots more stressful. You gotta have a lot of instrumentation so that you can tell what did go wrong or be sure that everything went right. You're talking about an army of controllers in a control room to pull, uh, pull it off with a complex uh, system like the shuttle. And lots of simulation to get everybody trained. A biggie is to verify the software. I mentioned the software is guaranteed to be wrong uh, on the first release and several subsequent. Uh, it's just the nature of um, building software. And so getting that checked out is, is a major one. And procedures. Um, when we flew uh, the orbital flight, the, uh, the checklist, the stack of checklists, just laid on top of each other was about this high for a 51 half and it weighed 210 pounds just to uh, call the flight data file. And then lots of time and expense uh, getting everybody really ready to go and, uh, and being sure that when you're going into an unknown uh, part of the envelope that the margins on the flight control are adequate so the surprises and the aero derivatives that, that hit you can be accommodated. I've uh,
ramble on a long time here. Or we could we could take a five minute break. I can answer questions however you want to do it. Maybe it's time for a stretch. Questions? Two minute break. Two minute break. <laughs> These people are tough. <laughs> <laughs> All right, break's over. <laughs> Okay, the, the next assignment for me was uh, being put on a uh, orbital flight test, uh, and specifically STS-3. Two-man crew, Jack Lasma, a, uh, a Marine, and uh, myself from the Air Force, we were uh, in pressure suits, you noticed. Uh, there and on ejection seats in the Columbia. This is uh, OV-101, uh, 102. Well, 101 was the Enterprise, 102 uh, the Columbia. And our countdown went uh, smoothly. This was in March of 82 and this is a uh, signature moment in your life when the SRBs light. Uh, it is, there's no doubt I mean, it looks smooth and nice as you as we're flying through a cloud here on launch, uh, logging weather time, I might add. <laughs> uh, but it's uh, it is rough and noisy and rattly, and uh, the acceleration is uh, right away, and it builds up to three Gs when the main engines are throttled back to whole three Gs, and so it, it's no doubt you're on your way somewhere really fast, wherever the solids want to go. Uh, everything worked good right up to uh, Miko and the uh, external tank as you saw drifted away and then here come uh, the first order of business uh, opening the payload bay doors so we can get the start rejecting heat with the radiators that are mounted on the inside uh, we're tailed down and as you watch here we're going right over Los Angeles uh, uh, at the time. This is just north of LA. You can see the uh, right. This is LA and uh, this uh, sorry, this is uh, Santa Monica and LAX and Palos Verdes right there. Anyway, uh, the first thing we had to do is get out a theodolite, that is a sighting device that surveyors use, and and take a daunting number of readings on on little targets that were pasted around inside the payload bay and on the doors as to measure where they were, and we did that through the flight every all the way along. <coughs> Uh, wasn't fast enough. Out in front of the nose there were some dark patches. That's where tile were, white tile, and fell off during launch. They actually found some washed up on the beach. Fortunately, none of the black tile on the bottom fell off, but we did lose some on the top. Uh, Zero-G is really one of the delights. There's two really good things about flying in orbit. Uh, weightlessness, and uh, the view out the window. And that's uh, like nothing that you experience even flying high performance airplanes. We had the uh, RMS cranked up. That was my job as the RMS operator. And we had a package in the back, the plasma diagnostic package to grab and move out there. Here are some scenes that show you the housekeeping area. In the corner there is the uh, John. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, long duration space flight exercise is important. It's, it's really not a big deal on a seven day flight. <laughs> uh, Jackson Marine, as I mentioned, he, he's got to have his daily ration of push ups, so here, we, here he goes. How about a one handed push up, Jack? 
How about a no-handed push-up? <laughs> uh, this is a quick summary. We went uh, one or seven days, and uh, the lake bed at Edwards they had a really wet spring. It was uh, unusable. So we went to White Sands, New Mexico. First day, uh, right as we're about to light the, the Ohms engines to... Uh, start the orbit they said hold off because this terrible dust storm was going on and we waited a day a delightful day uh, with nothing in the flight plan uh, much to enjoy ourselves and then came down the next day now we found another uh, gotcha in handling qualities here uh, right here jack thought the nose might be coming down too fast and tried to stop it and ended up doing a little wheelie and subsequent analysis showed that the whole response of the vehicle changes when you're down on the main gear only. And nobody thought of that. You know, it, it would seem like, uh, well, uh, they're worried about pitch in the air, but not while you're rolling on the main gear trying to derotate. So it resulted in uh, more software changes. Another thing we learned, they were pushing... Uh, Pushing for uh, auto land, and so we flew the f the whole turn onto final and down final hands off in auto land. The program wanted to uh, take this out of the hands of the crew. So here on the third flight, they uh, they had us sitting there watching the airplane fly down to pre flare and then the first chance Jack got to grab the stick was at the last minute to do the flare and landing. That was dumb when you look back at really dumb. And so now all flights, uh, Commander, if it's been auto down to uh, 40,000 feet where you go subsonic, will fly manually all the way down to get a feel for the airplane. Makes a lot more sense. So that's the way flights are done now. Uh, here's where we started uh, from orbit. This is how uh, Cape Canaveral looks. Uh, right here is the shuttle landing strip that's down there. You can see it uh, and the uh, launch pads are these two dots. And so that's uh, where usually a shuttle flight starts and ends. Here's a picture of our payload bay on SDS-3 and we did have a payload. Uh, previous uh, crews had pretty much empty payload bay. but. Uh, we had an environmental uh, measurement uh, thing, a lot of instrumentation, and this PDP, the uh, plasma diagnostic package, that uh, we actually had something to grab with the manipulator arm, as you see here. Uh, I looked around, I found, uh, I don't know if you can recognize this, but that's Cape Cod right there. Picture of MIT. Not a good picture, but there's got to be lots of better ones. But, uh, and here's where we ended up, the White Sands area near Almogordo, New Mexico. Okay, what did we learn? Uh, this is a pretty cryptic uh, summary. Uh, training was a real problem. The first two crews that flew SES 1 and 2 uh, were had all the attention of the training people and the simulators. They had priority, properly so. Uh, we were, uh, on the third flight, had low priority and really struggled. And we found when we got in the simulators that they didn't, when they didn't work right, nobody could explain why. Whether Many times we try an ascent and crash and burn and you always were scratching your head. Is this real? Is this the way the orbiter flies or is it some flaw in the simulator? So early on, uh, you're developing not only the orbiter but the training facilities. And the people didn't understand the system. We had more exposure from ALT to subsystems than the people that were supposed to be the experts. So it was a group learning process and a long way from what happens now when crews go in and they get the straight word right from the beginning on how things are. The tiles fell off. Not good. Uh, they, uh, 
change the bonding scheme, uh, improve the quality control, and uh, fortunately for the program, no critical tiles fell off. But uh, that was alarming. We looked out there, we reported it, took pictures of it, <laughs> looking at these gaps in the, in the system right out in front of the windshield. But uh, uh, the ground said, oh, don't worry, that's a cool area during entry. Entry is at 40 degrees angle of attack, so it is cool on top. Uh, they were right, everything was fine, but uh, uh, another tile thing was uh, after the flight, well actually I'll delay that, it was really more after the next flight. I mentioned how, uh, how the ride is, uh, first two minutes are uh, rough and exciting. The next uh, six or seven are smooth, and unbelievably smooth when you get on the main engines. And they more vibration than you're getting sitting in the chairs now. And it's just a steady, relentless push. Uh, it's a spectacular ride. Uh, but you're back in the uh, seat. Had an APU oil overheat uh, during that 3G part. Actually, about two minutes before Miko, uh, the ground called and said we need to shut down one APU. We're up past the point where we could uh, live without all three APUs running. So I had a chance to test what I worked on years previously. Uh, when the cockpit design, you're concerned about visibility when you're squashed in the seat at three G's and access and. Uh, the APU switches, we had to put them down here, and uh, I, I worried, I remember worrying specifically, if we got to get to the APU switches, the guy in the right seat, under 3G's, can he lift the helmet and look over there and find the correct switch, and you do not want to shut down the wrong one, one of the good ones. And uh, uh, it turned out, I guess with the adrenaline lifting this, heavy helmet of 3G's. I did it without even thinking about it and went right to the switch, so it, uh, it worked. Uh, general habitability was good in the orbiter. Uh, first time anybody lived there for uh, eight days. A good way to think about living in the orbiter, think of it as a camping trip. You know, you go on a camping trip, you don't worry about hot water and showers and all the niceties of home, you get in that frame of mind and it's fine. The food's adequate, the facilities are okay, although in, in our case the, uh, the toilet uh, ground to a halt. It, it's a drum that rotates to centrifugally uh, sling all fecal material out and contain it and it ground to a halt so we were into a real camping trip for a while on that. <laughs> Although it, it worked out. Uh, the, uh, the arm worked great, RMS. The uh, main jets I mentioned earlier uh, are uh, fortunately you don't use the main jets much. It'd be hard to sleep with them booming away, but you use the verniers most of the time. Verniers are uh, critical to smooth operation over long periods of time. All, uh, we spent a lot of time, uh, for instance, tail sun. Uh, for like three days, we put the tail right at the sun and stayed in that inertial attitude. And so it cooked the back end while the front end of the orbiter is cold. And we took all the theodolite measurements, opened and closed the doors. All of that uh, worked fine. The systems handled it. A lot of it was ground analysis and uh, how the temperatures were were extensively instrumented. And uh, we did notice a strange thing. It's a, not strange, but it became apparent when uh, when you're in orbit, uh, when you're on the sunny side of the Earth, I mean, it's as soon as the sun comes up, it is high noon bright. But there's no atmosphere around to diffuse the light. So when we're tail sun, it's hidden behind perfectly uh, eclipsed by the aft structure. And 
so there's no small sunball to be seen anywhere, even though it's bright sunny from just the reflections of the stru structure you can see out the window. I noticed looking at the uh, radiators, which are very, very smooth, concave surfaces out there and shiny silver colored, and it looked like there were bright diamonds uh, all along the surface when we were tail sun and finally figured out what, what the was. it was was just little specks of dust on the radiator which you wouldn't even notice normally but tail sun with exactly tail sun the sun's rays are coming right down exactly tangent to that surface and the least little thing on it would flare and uh, interesting effect uh, which was took me a while to figure out what all these bright spots on the radiators are. Um, uh, entry on SCS3 was uh, done uh, to a about nine o'clock in the morning landing at White Sands, New Mexico. So we started the entry halfway around the world. It's dark, and, uh, and most of the entry was in the dark, and. Uh, the plasma light show that happens as you get down in the atmosphere and the ionization that happens produces a spectacular scene out the windshield. I mean, it's, it also had us thinking about the missing tile that's, that uh, are going, but uh, uh, a night entry is really a show. My next flight was a day entry. It's not nearly as uh, uh, spectacular. Uh, mentioned about grabbing the stick too late, unfair to Jack, and then the derotation. Okay, now on to part three. How am I doing? Got, we might make it yet. Uh, STS-51F was uh, a whole different uh, situation than the earlier test flights. One big difference, there were seven people instead of two. With seven, we had to add a little bit on the patch to put the extra two names. Uh, this is the 19th flight. There's 19 stars. It's primary experiments. This was a science flight. It was a space lab, but without the laboratory. All equipment in the payload bay, full, stem to stern with telescopes, mostly. and. Uh, all the telescopes mounted on the pointing system we had were solar telescopes, so we had the sun and the accurate part of the sky. Uh, uh, here's uh, Orion and... Uh, Leo. What is it? Leo. Leo, the backwards question mark. Yeah. And uh, 19 stars, the 19. A lot of, lot of symbology here. Okay. Let me, uh, a short, entertaining video. Do the short one here. Now we had, uh, Seven people included three mission specialists, which uh, Dr. Hoffman uh, was when, when he was down in Houston. And we had two payload specialists, guys who were not uh, full-time astronauts. They were solar physicists, and they were the experts on the solar telescopes that we had and went along to fly. Our first try here at main engine ignition ended three seconds after ignition. We f felt the spacecraft rock around, the noise, and then poof, nothing. And we had a pad shut down because the left uh, engine, uh, the automatic uh, system, detected a failure, a slow acting valve, and it shut us off. So we're there wondering if we're on fire and whether we ought to race out and so forth. So it was uh, tense for a while, but there were, wasn't any fire, just this automatic shutdown. So we crawled out, uh, we're told there'd be a two week delay. So uh, I went down and uh, we took the kids to Disneyland and had a good time, went back home and started the whole training cycle again and came back two weeks later and uh, got a good start this time. 
but not after lying on our back on the pad strapped in for five hours because of some software uh, glitches that had to be fixed and uh, computers reloaded and tested and we uh, one of our reports was that five hours is the limit I mean you're lying on your back with your feet up in a pressure suit strapped in that's uh, more than is reasonable to ask uh, prior to launch uh, on the way up, well, I'll, I'll mention it later. Here's the instrument pointing system. This this baby was built in Germany. It's this device, this gimbal device, that held these four solar telescopes and the star trackers. Uh, here's a physics experiment. Uh, the Ohm's engines are lit. It produces one sixteenth of a g. Uh, the uh, thrust of the orbital maneuvering engines. If you're trying to sleep, that's what happens when the Ohm's engines come on. <laughs> and uh, you saw the water going across. Uh, it's deja vu. We had the same old PDP package on this, but, but with a difference this time. We, we took it out of the payload bay, brought it up here. That's my right ear you're looking at in profile uh, out the window. It's crowded up there. It's seven people up on the flight deck, all trying to get a view here, but we let go of it. And then uh, it had a uh, momentum wheel in there to cause it to spin up slowly, and we backed away from it, and we flew uh, a couple of uh, very uh, challenging loops around it. Here's a sequel to the the hairbrush. This is not me, it's Story Musgrave, uh, who has the same hairdo as I do. And uh, he's getting spiffied up for the TV show. That's how we did his horse around for for uh, seven days. Got extended a, a day to eight days again. And this landing was back at Edwards, runway two three, uh, in August, August sixth, when it was 105 degrees, lots of lots of heat waves. Uh, this landing was by far the most forward CG because we still had all that equipment in the payload bay. And uh, we were almost the heaviest orbiter landing. So getting the nose down before it fell down and crashed and broke the nose gear was one of my primary concerns uh, on this one. Okay. Uh, back to PowerPoint here. More about the uh, the actual launch itself. There's the uh, customary view. They put a camera right in close and got this really close-up view. Um, but it was about it was about five and a half minutes after this picture. We had delayed five hours. It's late afternoon, so very quickly uh, heading out over the Atlantic, uh, we were in darkness. And then, bang -o, the uh, remember it had been the left engine that got us uh, uh, on the pad abort. Well, the center engine shut down. There was, we were at three Gs, all of a sudden, we're at two Gs or something like that. Uh, instant square wave cutoff and acceleration. And uh, looking there and confirming, and the center engine shut down. What had happened was that uh, there are a number of sensors on the main engines. Uh, the particular one that got us was a uh, the uh, fuel high pressure turbo pump, a uh, piece of machinery running at 75,000 RPM, high pressures. The high tech gear that makes the main engine so efficient, uh, high ISP, but but really run at the limits of um, metallurgy and uh, technology. 
and the sensor that senses the output temperature was a series of four platinum wires in a cavity in the uh, in the output of that turbo pump and they had had some tendency for the wires to burn through when they burned through they they showed over temp was the electrical result of a burn through of one of these sensors well we had two burn through and the software said that's that, that must mean there's two sensors say you're too hot i'll shut the motor off and it did uh, there was well, no reaction. Uh, we just kept going straight and smooth. Uh, but it was um, now put us into uh, what's called an abort. Well, here's the here's the crew. I got seven of us. Uh, I'm. Uh, Need to practice this more but anyway it was a two shift operation we we're going to work around the clock so we had a red team and a blue team and i was a commander so i had a striped shirt <laughs> abort to orbit we had to call from the ground confirm what we knew already it means uh turning that rotary knob to ato abort to orbit kind of an oxymoron in a way it's not really an abort it's pressing on uh, and pushing the button behind it it loads the software in to do a couple things lower the insertion target we had tried to tried to get as high as orbit as uh, performance would permit but now we're going lower uh, engine down cost you total performance uh, and uh, we also started uh, dumping ohms fuel we had to turn on the ohms engines and we ended up dumping 4500 pounds of ohms fuel a little bit of extra thrust but uh, a significant loss of weight to allow the remaining performance to get us to an acceptable orbit and the last interestingly the last uh, sim we did on training in Houston before we went to the Cape to fly about two days before was an integrated sim where we're tied into all the controllers and everybody's working at a team and the very last run we had was a an ATO on a board to orbit and son of a gun that's what we did we'd always had trouble uh, starting a watch and we try to do everything internally on the crew so that if you lose calm with the ground you can can complete the emergency uh, properly on your own uh, on ATOs before we, we had to start a stopwatch at the time we started the ohms dump and we had a chart to go in to find out how many minutes of ohms dump we needed to do given at what velocity we lost the engine and uh, story's job was to do the watch and in the excitement of, of all the other stuff we had to do to get the ohms on we'd always forget the watch but this time he got the watch going so we actually did it right and uh, we knew that when we got to uh, where we burned out all the available fuel which we did we went to a fuel depletion cutoff uh, uh, that uh, we'd be really close to having to do a, a right away another ohms burn to get an acceptable orbit uh, we're right on the boundary as it turned out uh, we dumped the right amount of ohms that put us with every last drop of main main propellant gone we were just on the boundary of not having to do the first ohms burn and we could relax for uh, uh, 45 minutes later halfway around the world to do the final circularization so it worked out good except we were in a lot lower orbit than we had planned uh, and everything about this space lab flight depended on the orbit so we we're into a giant replan here's a nice picture of uh, the IPS also explain the the situation of, of the inhibit switch on and off and the, oh yeah this I don't know if I don't know how much yeah, you were uh, aware of what was going on there in the uh, yeah, cockpit, but it, it, it was... Uh, there's a switch in the cockpit that uh, you have a lot of parameters that are monitored in the software on the main engines, which, uh, which if they go out of tolerance, will shut the engine off. In fact, that's exactly why we lost uh, the, the center engine. Uh, but 
right after that engine shutdown, we're in a state where we really don't want to lose another engine because if we had, with only one left, we did not have the performance to get to orbit. We would have had to have gone to Zaragoza, Spain and land in the middle of the night where it was 10,000 foot overcast and raining. And I mean, if we'd pulled that off, we would have deserved some kind of medal. Uh, and uh, so, as, as a pre-planned procedure, when you lose one engine before the point where you can make, stagger into orbit on one remaining engine, uh, you inhibit the limits. You throw a switch that, that says, okay, now you're telling the engines to keep running regardless of over temps or anything because you take the chance, which is a big one, if something let go, uh, to, to uh, not be susceptible to the same thing that got us for the first engine, that is a sensor failure. And so we did that, we inhibited the limits uh, until we got to a point in the energy profile where we were Prestamico, that, that's the call, Prestamico, which means that we are now at a velocity where you can make it into acceptable low orbit on one engine if you should lose another one. At Prestamico then uh, the, the plan was we'll re-enable the limits so we're not hanging it out on a possible second engine failure uh, and we'd accept the second engine failure because we know we could make it on one engine. So we did that. The call came up. We went to enable. And then before we got there, we got another call from the ground that said, go back to inhibit. Well, it wasn't time to get a full explanation. We dutifully did it. What they saw on the ground is more failures on the, the right engine. Remember, the left got us on the pad abort. The center engine shut down on the way up. And to make everything equal, the right engine, the same sensors they could see on the ground, it's not visible in the cockpit, each of those four platinum wires, and they saw those starting to go. Clearly a design problem here. And because uh, they could tell those are going to go and get us that second engine, so that's why we went back to inhibit for the rest of the way. So it was uh, maybe a good war story, but we got there. Uh, and we started operating the IPS. The, uh, the platform uh, built in Germany uh, with all the telescopes. These are star trackers to uh, align where it is. And this baby could point. Uh, the spec was one arc second of accuracy. An arc second is the size of a dime if you're standing at the Capitol and looking at a dime at the Lincoln Memorial. That's how much it tends. But when we cranked it up, it didn't work with a hoot. Uh, they just couldn't get it to stabilize or point where it was supposed to. And for three days, the payload specialists and the MSs were in constant communication with the ground and they patched the software in a major way and kept sending up new software loads to get this thing to work. And voila, on the third day, they finally got it right and then it worked well and got a lot of good uh, solar science. Just a, an aside, when you're looking at pictures from space, uh, you tend to think, you walk around out here, the atmosphere is this big ocean of air above you, right? Lots of air way up there. This, this little bitty blue line right there, barely perceptible, that always appears on any sunlit picture showing the limb of the Earth, that's the same blue as, as the sky, the scattering that causes the sky to be blue. And that's all the thicker it is. It is just this little thin shell of atmosphere around, you know, at 18,000 feet, three miles up, uh, you've lost half the atmospheric pressure, and that's laying on an 8,000 mile diameter globe, and so, uh, and that's where all of human history has happened, in that little shell of air uh, laying around the globe philosophical point for you engineers.
What's uh, flying on orbit like? Well, it's uh, it's one of the 215 pounds of checklists. Here I'm checking propellant usage against what we got and where we are because we dumped 4,500 pounds of crucial fuel that we needed to make the plan most maneuvers had ever been done in the in the orbiter on our mission and we really worked to we didn't want an extra blip out of an rcs thruster and it worked very well we we got through seven days and even had enough to have another day of science uh, on the eighth day the flying is mostly watching the clock everything happens according to time and uh, since you got 16 sunrises and sunsets every 24 hours, you never know what time it is without looking at a watch. Uh, and you're looking at a crew activity plan with everything laid out. And so uh, we even had an alarm system you could set in the CRT to, to uh, make a tone to wake you up. So a lot of, a lot of clock watching. Uh, to pull off a complex mission like this. It's just the, the way life is on orbit. Now here's uh, one of our really serious high-level scientific uh, objectives. This was the official name, the Carbonated Beverage Test. Some, uh, I don't know if it's an MIT guy or not, uh, he's a real serious academic type an Indian I think anyway he built a, a coke can that had a lot of pressure regulators in there and laminar flow annular things uh, so many so that this coke can only held four ounces of coke but he talked uh, the White House Reagan was president and somebody on the staff approved gonna fly these coke cans and see if uh, they had a system to provide pop in orbit you know with the regular kind of carbonation and uh, dispense okay so we got the briefing and we had the four stowed in a locker and I got them out at the start of the test but uh, 30 days before launch all of a sudden this big thing came down Pepsi got wind of this experiment <laughs> and went to the White House staff and they they got Pepsi put on. I mean, Pepsi went into a crash program to fly four cans of Pepsi. <laughs> <laughs> so here's uh, uh, Carl Hennai's uh, trying the Pepsi. You notice that looks a lot like a shaving cream can? Well, that's how the Pepsi came out, just like shaving cream, this frothy <laughs> ball of stuff. And I mean, theirs was a last minute deal. It didn't have any uh, pressure regulators in it. It just uh, blew out there. And now we, we worried about having to make a judgment which tasted better. Well, the, the problem was they we didn't have any kind of refrigerator so they're both warm so warm pop is not my favorite and uh, uh, so they were not uh, anything that anybody fought over either any either kind but this was okay if you let the Pepsi float around it would uh, coalesce a little co2 in random uh, fashion but the the physics of it. <laughs> Carl found by blowing very carefully on the edge, he could get it spinning up. And spinning Pepsi would would have the froth at the poles and uh, the uh, liquid around the equator. <laughs> and we always had a towel guy standing by to, in case it drifted into something. I was getting pretty close. And <laughs> this is the end of the experiment here. And how he got it in his mouth without touching any of it. We had that same PDP, but as I mentioned uh, and you saw in the movie, we let go of it. We actually maneuvered all around the orbiter and looked at the wake through the plasma, let go of it. The proximity ops were very extensive and challenging and many, many maneuvers. 
that's uh, in the in the Caribbean, the tongue of the ocean, a spectacular coral uh, reef around very deep water. Here's uh, Gibraltar. The rock, I believe, is right out here on the point. Mediterranean there and the Atlantic here. You've heard you can't see borders from space. Not true. This is uh, Israel this way and Egypt this way. <laughs> wow. And the Gaza Strip along here, which uh, has been in the news as of late. And in the same area, the Dead Sea, the Sea of Galilee. Here's most of Israel in one picture. A little closer to home, this is uh, most of New Jersey. Long Island, there's Manhattan. Hudson River and East River. This, uh, there have been about 10,000 copies of this picture. This is uh, Southern California. This is San Diego right here. Los Angeles. And in a high-res print, you can see uh, water here, which is San Francisco Bay. And the center of it all is the Antelope Valley right here, where uh, where I live and where Edwards is right here. This is the San Andreas Fault right through here. Closer up of LA, which after the at the end of uh, 51F, we we came right by Catalina Island, right up the Harbor Freeway, and into Edwards. We went by uh, Harbor Freeway at about uh, Mach 3. And closer up of the dry lake at Edwards and the landing. Flight test results, which uh, most of which I've mentioned already. And uh, to finish up, I've got reports on a memory stick here. The, the pilot reports we wrote as crews, uh, which you can take uh, at your leisure if you're interested, uh, and copy it off and. Uh, they're available. Not great works of art, but the specific things that we learned on doing the flight test. And uh, these are just thoughts of, of transitioning into operation from test mode, which I got to see the whole gamut from beginning to uh, full operational. So I apologize for uh, running over, but. Uh, I don't think anybody minded. <laughs> As you see, everybody's listening very, very rapidly. Still so, here, yeah. Thank you, uh, thank you very much for taking the time.